Klaus Stankov, and today I'm going to talk about uh, our React Architecture program. But first, let's uh, thank our sponsors. Uh, you can find me in Twitter, in GitHub, in my blog sometimes. You can also find me in this small country called Bulgaria. <laughs> Uh, in my free time, I organized uh, the, Re the React Notaconf, which is actually a conference in Sofia. Uh -huh. And in my daytime, nighttime, and sometimes weekends, I work in a program. Otherwise, it would be weird to talk about the right <laughs> work there. Uh, my slides uh, are already available here because I have a tendency to change slides quite fast. And I noticed a lot of people do stuff like that. So. Uh, don't worry if you missed like any slides with code and stuff like that. Just you have that and you have it. So yeah, so today we're going to talk about the architecture. But as the previous talk mentioned, it's talking about that like just with empty words is not very fun. You have to understand the context. Like this is one of my favorite books if it existed. That context is always the king. So before I start the, uh, going deep dive, I'm just going to tell you some context about Prologant. Like Prologant is a web application. It looks like that today. Tomorrow will be different. Or actually Wednesday. Uh, the engineering team is quite small. We have just seven engineers. Everybody is full stack. So they start from our server, database, GraphQL API, React, to CSS or some business decisions. Story-wise, the code base started in 2014 with uh, Ruby on Rails and uh, some backbone and jQuery on top of it. Uh, the nice thing about it is I don't need to explain how that looked. In 2015, we started sprinkling some uh, React here and there and it started growing a bit like a weed. So it started taking over whole pages and fully take over the whole application. So in 2016, we had like some state issues, so we introduced Redux, uh, which worked well, it was quite fun, but it had some issues as well. So in 2017, we started like, doing some migrations and we moved to GraphQL and Apollo, both on like the server with GraphQL, again with Rails, and we lived happily ever after until 2019 where we had the opportunity to start like a brand new product with like a clean slate. And everybody was, okay, let's clean everything up. Like this is uh, the product, it's still not, it's still in a wait list mode, it's not fully released. But we say, okay, let's take what we learned from our architecture and start moving into the new one and build it in a such a way that we know we're going to migrate it out of the things we use every day. Uh, the current architecture is we basically still use Ruby on Rails, it's a GraphQL API provider. We have a fleet of uh, Node.js uh, apps because for us Google is a very important client, so uh, we, we need to have server side rendering. And today I'm going to focus just on the front end stack and the React in general. So this was uh, Prologant's uh, initial uh, stack. So we used React, GraphQL, Apollo, Prettier, as we find out CSS modules because they were actually faster. <laughs> there we used Jest, and we had this weird guy here, flow type. Uh, the reason we started with flow type was in 2015-16, uh, TypeScript didn't work with React. And back then, it was really hard to integrate TypeScript into something you know, which is half different JavaScript and mix things together. So for the new stuff and from the last year of program, we started migrating to TypeScript. So that's fun now. The other trend here is Redux. When we, start, it's, uh, when we started using Apollo and GraphQL, and we started noticing that we start, uh, we understand, okay, what data, what state has to be global, what has to be local for a component. We notice that Redux store just, nobody visited that. Like, it has a lot of spiders in the text editors there. It was not very used, so we didn't use it. And the, the one thing which we had to build back in 2016, 15, was we have to build our own server-side rendering. We have to do our own webpacks, 
we have to do a lot of paper work, and nowadays uh, there is this thing called HGS, which does this for us. Uh, one interesting thing is when you start thinking about React and architecture, there is one picture that always gets in my head, and it's this one. Like, you want to build something, and React just gives you that small tool, and you want to build it. And the thing about it is, when you start building stuff, you have to know why, what you want to do, because you can very hard uh, put yourself in a very weird corner and finding out, okay, <laughs> how do I get out? And especially in a startup, when you're moving fast and having a lot of breakfast and breakfast, depending on the country, like you're riding, you're like spinning down, you need to have some like guiding principles about, okay, what, how can I build stuff? So the way we structure like the guiding principle of the engineering organizations are we, we tend to have like good defaults. We have to have like it has to be really like you don't need to configure much. Uh, we have to have a good code organization. We shouldn't worry why is this React component in my TypeScript folder or my Ruby script sits in the CSS folder. Right? You shouldn't ask questions like that. Uh, my favorite one is uh, you should make the common operations easy. Like all the common things we do as engineers, like the mechanical tasks, should be very easy. And the nice thing about that is you actually have to know which of the common things you do. And you also have to be able to isolate dependency and accessibility use of it is just to have engineers because we as engineers write that work. But there's another right nice book I like, uh, Top is Cheap, Show Me the Code book. I would also buy it if it exists someday. So let me actually start showing you some actual code. So I'll use this page from our new project as an example. And give you like an overview of what's there. So if you open your editor of choice, BIM, uh, you just see that folder. It's like this is the folder directory structure of the application. The only missing thing is like we have like seven or eight config files for maps or TypeScript. But we know that. And if you look at the structures, there is three types of things here. It's support stuff, stuff which supports building stuff. We have components, what the React is, and we have pages because we do a web application, it's all nice in pages. Like you can think of as this pyramid where you have the support, on, on support you build the components and then you have pages. It's a bit like that if you think about it. It's a bit like you have the support crew, they drive the components and the components combine the pages. And this is like from the next talk, I'm just going to have this directory structure and split it into its logical part. Support, components, and finally go with the pages because you won't understand a lot much of the pages if you don't have the background. So let's get with the support stuff. So the first file, like the easy one, is the config. Like it's a very easy file. This is how it looks. We have other stuff, but we decided very early on we want to use this as a facade to every configuration in the application and gets here. We have uh, and we want to keep it far from, like, Next.js has its own configuration system, but we don't want, but we have a rule, don't touch Next.js stuff uh, in most of the application. We have a facade on top of it, because when we switched from Next to something Next, something else, it will be easier. Uh, also, another interesting thing is this environment thing. Like, especially when you do server side rendering, it's important to know if you're in the browser, if you're in the production, if you're in a test environment, because we have end to end tests, and sometimes we need some stuff to be marked as test. Another interesting folder is the GraphQL stuff. Like, we build the whole application, and a lot of our system is built on top of GraphQL. It's a big bet. Hopefully it pays out someday. I mean, it pays out now. So uh, there is this very interesting command there. It's called Apple Client Code Gen, and this thing does connects our whole infrastructure. Like it gets from Rails, it gets the GraphQL schema from Apollo used in our application. It gets the queries and it generates TypeScript types. What I mean is, we have this fragment definition. 
in our code. We have this, this says that we need this data, we have a profile, we have the avatar, and so on and so forth. And this thing generates a TypeScript for us. It generates this type file, and we can just import this type file from our types and we use it across our system. As we learned in, our, in the second talk of the day, having like good types generated automatically without engineers doing work is one of the best things ever. It's like magic. It's really nice thing. And speaking of magic, the other thing we started using a lot recently is hooks. Like, we learned from our first talk of the day that hooks are cool, and we use all the common setups. Like, this is a couple of the hooks we have. Use key, just creates a keyboard shortcut. Use is mounted, just checks if the component is currently mounted. It has its timeout. Use height on top is interesting. What it does is it monitors if the, if the page is scrolled to the top, or otherwise it shows this nice button uh, scroll to the bottom, or we, does, or we do something else in another place. But the more interesting ones are those three fellows. One is called use GraphQL Fragment, where we give it a GraphQL Fragment, it gives you the data from its cache. Mm -hmm. uh, use Viewer gives you the currently logged user, the information about the currently logged user, mm -hmm. and in a lot of cases we don't care who is the user, we just care if the user is logged in or logged out. So the, the thing we notice when dealing with hooks is they are very well composed are compositing each other. Like those three hooks are using like this is like the is logged in is built on top of you use viewer, use viewer is used on top of fragment and there is like a component somewhere here from Apollo which actually gets the whole data. And this works quite well. Those two folders server and static for Next.js, we need some custom server for proxying. We have some static files for static files. <laughs> Uh, not very interesting. We have this types folder, like we need some types, some libraries we use don't have proper TypeScript, so we need to do it for ourselves. There's this utility folder. <laughs> like it's a really good folder, it's full of like useful toys. Uh, like for example, we have uh, our this uh, small test uh, function which is called format count, where you give it count and your number. And it's like, imagine you have a search result, and you say zero search results, or search result. And the nice thing about it is we have a lot of tests for the utilities. Uh, they're living in the same folder. One small trick with the test, by the way, is here we import the function, and here we use to describe the function name. So when we rename the function name, we don't need to change the test how they look. <laughs> so we have a lot of small tricks like that. Another interesting utility is dates, because we need to work with dates. And all the date work is actually centralized in this single file, dates.ts, contains all the, all the things we needed for our dates. And initially we started with this work, like you have moment.js, we have date utility, you have some random component and it's put on a page. And that was great, but uh, moment.js is not very friendly for code splitting. It's quite large, and what we did was okay. We replace it with def uh, uh, date and fns. And the thing about it is, when we change that, we didn't change anything of the chain. The chain didn't know about stuff. So the code, code was designed to be in uh, in this evergreen mode where we change it constantly. All the uh, the, the bottom dependencies and the top ones sit there. Also, another small trick we use is. A lot of our application, they didn't work in isolation. We have a lot of code which is not ours, and it's used for things like tracking, exception tracking. Uh, so what we do is in utils we have this folder external. It could be root folder, but I like it to be hidden, so we lie ourselves that we don't have stuff like that. And we have this external where we group everything which talks to an external service from our application. Like intercom, having like this small button there, one signal for push notifications, and everything there is grouped. So if an engineer has to wonder, okay, how is this works in the rest of the system, it's in a central place. So that's basically like what the support system of the whole um, uh, works. The next one, and like the biggest chunk of the 
is about components. Like we're on the React conference, like all of the stuff I already show you, it's not very React specific except for maybe. So yeah, so first you'll notice that all our components live in the folder components. We don't have containers, we don't have any directory structure in here because we don't want to care uh, about when you use a component, is it the container? Is it not? You shouldn't carry as a user of this container. You should carry where the component is. And yeah, that's uh, the components are basically things which are reusable between pages, like stuff which you just copy, then put, put it there, just a bit, and play with it. The way we structure our components is we use the component as directory pattern, where pretty much all our components are a directory. And the file there is always named the same. Like, we are very strict about naming. Like, for example, if a component needs some data from the server, it has to have a fragment file where, which defines, OK, what's the data you need from the server. And so it's called fragment, because when you do import and you nest the fragment, you don't need to worry, wonder, OK, what's this naming convention? How is this name? You just say, I need from this component slash fragment it's there. Also, if the, if the component does some operation <coughs> to mutate data, the mutation lives in its own file, it's always called mutation. The nice thing about it is you can build, uh, most of the team have like shortcuts, like you're opening the index file and you see the file and you have the shortcut and it automatically opens the fragment because it's not its name. We also have the CSS files which live there. We have utilities file which is like the common functions. And having, and we also used a lot of subcomponents. Like some components need to have other smaller pieces to be also React components. We move them in separate folder because in some future tense we might move it as a really reusable thing. Uh, so one of our core components and part of the style system uh, is our font component. It's basically all the text. Uh, because before that we had uh, 50 shades of uh, font sizes in our application and we had a big scoop where we actually start actually for at one point we had a linter which checked only in these directories you can all uh, directories the CSS file can have this uh, font size property but we removed that because it's not needed anymore so we basically have this component font and you can say it looks like a bit of like style component, but when we started using this pattern, style component doesn't exist. And uh, we use CSS modules. So this is how these components look like. This is its implementation. It's very simple. You just get a text. You have the children. You have the class name. You, this is how CSS modules work. That's actually, I think, one of the best things ever as a person who have written a lot of CSS in my life is having like a CSS file with descriptive class names you have a component where you use that with TypeScript you actually have generation of type safety that your CSS class names are valid for this file so if I rename the text uh, class name the TypeScript would complain that this thing doesn't exist so okay yeah, I'll fix it and this thing afterwards generates these unique class names which don't collide because in our application if you open our CSS, I think on one of the pages we had like 100 container class names underscore something else, but they were all like containers, like they worked. So the nice thing about here is, okay, this is the font component in render and span, but what do you need, what, what do you do if you need to render like a paragraph? Like, how do you deal with paragraph? And this is a part the pattern which also emerged was, and we use this a lot, is having this component property. We say, okay, the component here is P, and this works. And the nice thing about that is when we implemented it, you for component you can for example say a link. Like I can have a link component because it's just React component. And here you can say, okay, this is a link to this page, it gets rendered. And this is like passing the custom component as a prop. Like we use this a lot in our application. 
And the implementation for this is like <coughs> very, 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 very simple. Like it's just one line. <coughs> and this thing has uh, can get very hairy at some points, but it's really very powerful. And all the engineers know, okay, there is a component property I can do this with that. One thing to notice here, by the way, this is uh, I have a pet peeve. Notice how we pass children here. Here, so we have the props here, the props here. Like, we have that. Basically, we can have just that. That's one of my pet peeves sometimes, is that children is just like a regular prop. You can just pass it by, and you can just have this nice thing. So, yeah, so we have our component here. We have the text. Uh, and sometimes we need to add some custom class name. Like, that's needed sometimes. Like, maybe add some spacing around it. Maybe add some color, like for some reason people like color, I don't know why, <laughs> and stuff like that. So you just add it there, and okay, but if we pass the a class name, it's going to collide with the class name we already have given it. And we use this small library called class names mm -hmm. a lot in our application. It's just have like a weird property, you pass it whatever <laughs> as an argument and it generates valid class names. It's a pretty small library. It's just like a function. Basically, use it all the time. It's really small utility. The other part of our application is uh, this small book. It's called Dealing with Forms with React. <laughs> like, we have a lot of forms in our applications. Like, uh, a friend of mine was telling me, like, you can be a web engineer, you can live very happily, but then you have to do some forms. <laughs> Everybody has to do forms in their life. So, what we notice, like our application is not very, it, even if it was very business like usually your forms have the universal structure. Like they have labels in some ways, they have the text there, the error messages have to be in a consistent place. Like it's forms are fairly, like fairly similar. So, what we built was this is our, basically, all our forms look like that. We have this form mutation. You pass in the graph your mutation, you say what to do on submit. Uh, we also use this pattern of common components got grouped together like a package. Mm -hmm. So when the developer reads the code, it's, they see the hierarchy and it's less important. And here you can see, okay, we have a field. Oops, where is my course? Oh, yeah. So we have a field, we can give it special controls, we can pass property. I mean, this, this is very simple, this is really simple. And it's one thing about the forms is a form is just like a state machine. Like it has an input, it has a loading state. Hopefully, it can go to success or it can go to an error. And usually, you get some error, and yeah, you can get the error from uh, the client. But a lot of but you should always have validation on the server. Like you can have it. You do some remote call, it either says everything is okay or it turns error. And since you control our backend, we have a standardized way for every mutation we have to return this same structure. So this is how mutations look at product hunt. Like we have a very particular naming scheme. We always say, okay, it's, the, it's called response. We have node, which is always the return result is called node. So in this way, our phone helper can always know what the result is and just pass the result on the whole thing. We have unified forms errors here. And basically, that part, it's always the same for any mutation. We have even think about to build some tooling around it to just make the interesting part there. But having this unification stuff makes the form very work very easy. Because all of our forms, we just connected to a mutation, we have a library to build mutations in the backend. They all return the arrows, they are also always mapped in the correct way, the form always return whatever. So building a form is not that hard. Another thing which is kind of hard with forms is uh, like designers want to have like those custom controls. And we use this pattern which I already mentioned, like passing the component as props. Like if you notice here, I'm passing the control as an email, text area, or select in some options. But I can also pass the control. And the control can be something like this. It can, this is like a fairly complicated component. Like it has a search, you can add stuff to it, you can remove it. And for us, 
This is a unit which you, which you build in isolation and you just pass it a, a, a shortcut into the form system. So this is how this component looks like. Uh, as you notice here, we import, since a lot of code I've highlighted a bit, uh, so here we are importing the type from the from GraphQL, so this component is actually type safe, it knows what gets returned from the whole system. We have our own types for, okay, it accepts these fields, and this is the thing which works with uh, an array, because this, this input actually handles array data. So we just have our functions. Here we have these custom hooks, like we have a lot of hooks which are just used for very specific components. Like actually this new slot copy by these hooks is really big. Like I'm a bit ashamed to show it on the slides and that's the reason I'm not going to show it. <laughs> so it's quite large. And, and the other final piece we have is we have this is actually a usable search input, like all the search inputs have the similar structure. We have our item list which are very specific to this component. And we have the special properties already. So our phone library understands a lot of the language those components work. And that's it, like it's, it's not that big deal. Like the, the engineer who worked on that actually worked on, we have like this separate page which is called developer uh, dev slash playground, which is involved in development where they just build that and they just put it into three forms. And there's one interesting question here, which is the form library we're using. Like, we are having this question, and it's like a very interesting question. Like, do we use uh, <laughs> final form, do we use formic? Like, I love formic, I also love final form, I love them both, what do we use? Like, we use one of them, because we always use the library. I won't tell uh, what we use, because to be honest, they're both great. Uh, and yeah, it, it's, it's they're all the right choices. So the nice thing about the forms, and the forms is one of the biggest packages we have, but we try to have that unified styling, so they look the same, the user have a great feeling. They have the common interface, like focus on the interface, it's not the implementation. Support custom inputs, and that's the reason to extend with custom components, because React is basically pushing us to put the complexity of the component. And in our case, understand that we have the GraphQL and use it. Another interesting thing you have to deal with <laughs> applications is buttons, like if stuff that's clickable. So we have a button, and it's very Swiss Army knife thing. Like it removes a lot of the rules of having def defaults and small number of options. Like for a button, you can pass the href, and you can say, okay, this is the page, over. You can also pass the click handler and a loading text. If the click handler returns a promise, the button cannot be clicked until the promise is resolved. And we actually replace the button text with a loading stuff. Because that's something very often we do. We also have this power hacks. We have a confirm, because often you need to confirm on operations. Uh, since we work with GraphQL, you can just pass it a mutation, some input to the mutation, set a loading text, and say, OK, what to do after the mutation is done. So this is basically, I mean, it's one line of technical, but it's like six liners, and you do a backend operation with all the validation, with all the errors, and all the security of that. And that's cool. And th this works quite well. We also have a check, which I forgot to add here. We also have a flag here, which is required login. So if you click the button and the user is not logged in, we ask the user to log in. I got to add here, but it's also one very useful thing because I can imagine that in a lot of your application, especially if they are if the user who are logged in or not logged in can access the same pages, you have actions and you want the user to click the action to tell him you have to do whatever to log in. Uh, we also use uh, we are currently migrating, like this is one of the migrations we started having two weeks ago, is migrating the forms, like having the buttons work like that, having like golden button, solid button, white button, text button, icon button. Initially this was always the same button, but it got so hairy and complicated. But again, it's for the, the 
components which we are building, they are like a utility core with some styling and the main launch of Spreaker on top. Uh, another example is this button here, like this is our uh, multi light button. So the way this button works is it, it's, it's a component, and this component we actually got a domain component because it does domain logic. It's because button every application has buttons, right? Our button is the same as your button, they just look different. But like buttons have different like logic. Um, another thing which we call domain components, stuff like that, like except that we copy us, your application won't have that. Like this is very specific to our application. So we try to split the components into two like imaginary borders. Uh, one is called, we basically call them utility components, like components like button, font, forms. And uh, the other ones are called domain components, which are like, this is the question card component. Uh, actually, this is the answer card component. The answer card component, it uses the like button, it uses the button, the card looks like that. It has some details, but it's a lot of mixed stuff like answer cards, the main button component. We have a box which is utility. Light button is also like a domain because it interacts with the back end. This kind of looks like atomic design if you squint a bit, just kind of. I mean, it's, but we don't have like folders of molecules and the other things because why? Like, they are really good framework in terms of, okay, we think about that on an abstract level. Is it a big component, small component, is it combining? But in our case, we just have generic components and domain components. They live in the same folder because in a couple of situations we have seen a domain component become a generic one and a generic becomes a domain. So they live in the same folder because again, we want to minimize the, the moving of files. Like if I move a component from one folder to the other, I have to change the files. The diffs got messy. Like we have this policy, like if you want to queue a component, it goes to a place called the legacy folder, and the diffs there are really crazy. But they're like, we think about it like this component have done their duty to our app, and they need this salute <laughs> of uh, being grenaded. Uh, and the final part, I'm going to talk about is the pages because if we don't have pages, we don't have anything. So the page system contains those four things. The first thing, and I'm mentioning this, is it's a small hack. I haven't seen many people do it. It's this is all our routes. Like we have this path file where all the routes are functions with for building the routes. In this way, if we need to rename a route. We have the type safety, like nobody makes a typo that the, the user folder is just uh, the user slash one page is called the users one dot. It's, uh, this gives us the type safety. We have a separate place here. Also here we have utility for like arguments. Yeah, it's written by hand, but it works quite well. And the way it works is you just import paths when you need it. We have a rule you never pass the string directly to href if it's not to this function. You just build that, and it works. It's a very small hack, but I think, but it helped us a lot in the early days. And it keeps us, it also doesn't care about which output library we have. I think URLs are here to stay for the next five, six years, maybe. Uh, the other things, we, we separate the pages in things called layouts. Like, if you notice this page, like, this part is quite similar to the rest of this. Like, you can imagine clicking on this Menu app just changes the center here. And if you think about it, all our pages most probably have the same header. So we have our main layout, which is the header. We have something called content with mobile menu. This is what we have like on the mobile version of the slide menu. We have a footer. We have this useless cookie banner policy, which somebody requires us to add it, some of the legal guys. Uh, this is like the other layout. It's built on top of the main layout. It has its own stuff. And it all lives there, we just use it. Uh, this pages folder, why do we have pages and routes? Like, this is like the first thing, uh, the, the, like we moved some people across the project and they were, why do we have pages and routes? What, what's the difference here? So, the way Next.js works, 
is it has this pages folder, and in pages folder, the way stuff works is the way the folder structure is there does the URL. So this URL here, pages, profiles, uh, slug, and the parameters, like a dynamic parameter, they added quite recently. And this makes that your directory structure matches your URL structures. And we change our URL structures time to time, and also everything in this pages folder like there is ways not to be exported, but gets exported into its own bundle with all of that. And this makes us kind of dependent on our routing, makes us dependent on a lot of things. So what we do is pretty much all our pages just look like that. So we just have the page, we have our own domain structured logic, and we just render those pages. And you use this uh, pages thing like just like a blog file router. It's a little hack. But if we needed to migrate out of Next.js next month or something, we just need a new router. And we can just use everything we have. Also, it gives us this very clear border. And for me, it's easier to think about the main, how we group things into main, not so much in URLs, because URLs are very user-facing things. Um, so the route starts the way we, that's uh, the rails. Again, we have. Uh, things structured in modules. All the pages have custom components which live their own pages. Component doesn't go to the component folder if it's not used all across the board. All of those have a query file which is okay how the data gets loaded. There is some custom CSS. Luckily for some pages there isn't a custom CSS because they can be built only by reusable stuff. And if you think about the pages, pages are very similar across the board. Like every page has this life cycle where it has some loading state, like it loads data so we show some loader. If we are unlucky, we get to an error, error, error state. In this error state, we have identified like four types of error. Server error, something is on fire, uh, not found error, like this page doesn't exist, this user doesn't exist and authorization and authentication errors. Like, you are not logged in, you cannot see this page. Oh, you are logged in, but you are not an admin, so you cannot touch this page. Or, there is the success state, and when you go to success state, every page has the same things that you need to do. It needs to set up the search engine tags, like all the OG data, all the shareable stuff. It needs to set up some analytics, like, okay, track that the user was on this page. There is a lot of other minor things there, and then you just need to render a page. So what we did was uh, we have this uh, utility function called create page, which, every, which builds the state machine, handles all the data loading, handles all the errors, and handles a lot of the common situation. Like this is how it looks like. Uh, the power here is just that it gets a query. It can set the query variables based on the URL parents and the context of the user. So it handles all the loads. It handles the loading state, it handles everything, it works there. Uh, it, we have this required flag, like we can say, okay, this page is only for loading users. Oh, sorry. Yeah, so query, we have this GraphQL type. From the query, we actually do the GraphQL type. And we just pass it as an argument to the page, as a type argument, and automatically all those friends, nodes, that was the response of the server, so everything here is type safe, so we don't need to define any other types here. We have these flags, so we can say, okay, require login. Like, we can say, this page only for login users, require permissions. <coughs> only show the profile to the user who can manage this profile. Uh, there will be a talk later in the conference about feature switches, feature flags, and testing in production. Uh, since uh, pretty much every feature we run goes to in production that is visible only to certain users, we have this automated by a required subfeature flag. And just by this, the system knows how to check the current user, to check if they have the, the, the flag on, if they have it all, what to do and what to not do. We have some search engine stuff, like we have the tags, we have the title, so this is, makes the page SEO friendly. And then finally, we just render the page. Like, but you as an engineer just have like a checklist of things your page have to do, and it's just arguments, 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 and you do the things you can do the best, like just render this page. 
And the final thing is data loading, like we use GraphQL. So for this page, you can split it into areas. Like GraphQL support this thing called fragments, where you can get all the data. So in this page, we have three fragments. If you zoom in, we have the avatar fragment is in the header fragment. If you zoom out, we need even more. So the, the way GraphQL works is it wants to just have multiple fragments nested into each other and build something like that. <laughs> like this big query gets, gets compiled. For this, we generate the types so we know every component, what they need. It's in the query. It's there. We just list it here. And the whole page just automatically gets assembled and it works. So let me recap or what the things, like some of the takeaways, because again, I covered quite a bit. First, again, we are very dependent on GraphQL, hopefully for the next three, at least three, four years. <laughs> uh, when we do components, we are trying to isolate dependencies. Like we want to push dependencies downward, so when we do migrations, we migrate as much as possible. Like things as, as React are very too core right now to isolate React as well. Uh, we use directory as for them quite a bit with very consistent naming structure and we have this mind separation between domain components. So when we build pages, we have the layouts, we have this path helper, which is like a small hack, but it can fix, if you can save one or two days of bug fixing over all the year. Create page is like one of the most important utilities we have. Like in Volgrunt, because of create page, we're able to migrate two times from React router to another router, to another router, without changing pretty much anything, and just relying all the logic in the creative page. So yeah, thank you very much. <laughs>